and welcome everyone here to our uh, question and answer session and hopefully conversation around the 49th annual Natural Hazards Research and Applications Information Workshop. And my name is Lori Peek, and I am the director of the Natural Hazard Center here at the University of Colorado Boulder. And it is my honor to welcome you all here today. Next slide, please. So part of my task this morning is to share a few words about the history of the workshop. And in order to tell a little bit about the history of the workshop, we need to begin with our founding director, Gilbert Fowler-White, the esteemed geographer who's widely known as the father of floodplain management. And back in 1975, Gilbert White actually hosted the first natural hazards workshop here in Boulder, Colorado. And I think right now I'm seeing 42 people on this meeting. I think there were fewer people than that at the very first natural hazards workshop. So we could probably about count on our fingers and toes how many people were at that first meeting. But back in 1975 up to today, the meeting really ha has remained with this common purpose of bringing together researchers and practitioners and policymakers, bringing together people across sectors at different career stages, but what all of the people who attend the workshop share in common is this desire to reduce the harm and suffering caused by disasters. And over the years, the workshop has grown from this very small meeting held here in Boulder, Colorado, along the Boulder Creek and with a barbecue held up at where Gilbert's Ranch used to be located in Sunshine Canyon, just to the west of Boulder. To today, it's grown to a meeting that attracts nearly 650 people every year from across the United States, and about 10% of our participants are international each year. About 20 to 30% of our participants are first timers who attend the workshop, and we still attract people from all of those different walks of life and professional backgrounds every single year. Next slide, please. So I wanted to share some of the traditions associated from the workshop with the workshop. And so again, the workshop has changed and it has grown dramatically over the years in terms of the number of people who attend the workshop, the different organizations that they represent, the different ideas and perspectives and diverse knowledges that they bring into the workshop. But at the center of the workshop, the single most important tradition is the people. It is the diverse people representing all different walks of life who attend this workshop. For many years, the workshop was actually by invitation only. And the logic for that, why the Natural Hazard Center only sent out invitations and you could only attend if you got one of those coveted invitation letters was because the center for many years really tried to sort of curate the workshop to ensure that there would be that appropriate mix of researchers and practitioners and policymakers. Several years ago, though, we really made the decision that the workshop's been around for a long time, nearly 50 years now. And we've really made the decision to stop only doing workshop by invitation because we realized that the downside of that is that obviously it can become exclusive. And so now workshop registration is open to anybody who can attend and we still attract that diverse mix of researchers, practitioners and policymakers but we do have to cap the registration, both because of the size of the venue where we hold the workshop, but also because we want to maintain the character of the meeting, which is really, again, about at its root, about trying to ensure people can connect. So how do we do that? On Monday morning, every single person in the room, in the opening plenary room, stands up if they are able and introduces themselves. And so in that spirit of one of our long-standing workshop traditions, could everybody who's on here, could you please take to the chat and would you just put your name first and last and your affiliation? And so I would put Lori Peak Natural Hazard Center. 
If you're on the webinar right now, could you please again take to the chat and put your name and affiliation? Thank you so much. Looks like people are listening, you're fired up, and you will be ready for that Monday morning self-introduction on July 15th, 2024. Next bullet, please. Another uh, quality of the workshop that we're deeply committed to, because we do bring together diverse people from all different kinds of organizations, the workshop is an AFZ, it's an acronym-free zone, and so we ask in all seriousness that when everybody stands up to speak, they both introduce themselves. So if they're getting ready to share a story or ask a question in a session, that they say who they are. And again, that's rooted in that desire to have people connect. But then we also ask that people do not use acronyms when they're speaking, because we can't assume that somebody knows what an acronym means. Next, please. We also at the workshop have long break, breaks that are 30 minutes long, and then we have an hour and a half lunches. And the reason for those longer breaks and lunches are because, again, at that root, we're trying to get people to connect, to network. And so we offer that extended time for that. We also, every year, honoring Gilbert's tradition of having that barbecue up at San Sunshine Canyon, we have a barbecue in Boulder. And in the concurrent sessions, we have very limited use of PowerPoint in those sessions, and we reserve about half of every session for discussion. And that is because we really treat panelists as sort of provocateurs who are trying to engage people in conversation. We also recognize that anybody who's sitting out in that audience, they have expertise, they have stories from the field, they have research findings that they are looking to share. So we try to reserve lots of time for discussion and interaction. And then finally, again, sort of starting and ending with probably the most important traditions of the workshop. We recognize that every single person who attends this meeting has something important to share. And we want to hear everyone's voices and we wanna hear everyone's story. And so that again, gets at how this entire meeting is designed to try to facilitate those connections. And two, that idea of everyone having a story to tell. This year's theme at the Natural Hazards Workshop is the stories we tell creative strategies for understanding and communicating disaster risk. Beginning in 2017, every year the workshop has been organized around a theme. And the theme for the annual workshop is oftentimes written in response to big issues or challenges or opportunities that are unfolding in our hazards and disaster community. And so, we all know in this community that disasters are coming faster and more furious. They're affecting more people. And as more and more people come into this field and are trying to learn, as more and more people in the public are witnessing these disaster losses are occurring, we're looking for new strategies, time-tested techniques for ensuring that we're communicating risk to diverse populations in equitable ways. And so this year's workshop keynote and also the plenary sessions, as well as a select number of the concurrent sessions will pick up on this theme of the stories we tell. But as you are gonna hear about in a moment, not all of the sessions are dedicated to the theme because we're committed to making sure that the, the workshop really provides a download on cutting edge policy research findings and, um, and progress that are be that's being made in practice. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Assistant Director of the Natural Hazard Center, Jennifer Tobin. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Lori. Okay, now I am very excited to discuss our call for ideas, which is now open. And so I'm gonna briefly touch on a few things, but feel free to drop your questions in the chat as we go along so we don't miss important questions and we get to cover everything once we turn to the Q&A session at the end. Okay, uh, first, it is most important to know that our workshop submission form will close on January 26, 2024. So please mark that date in your calendars and make sure that you submit all your ideas be by then. Um, we are accepting ideas for a variety of session types uh, using the same form. Um, so there's not different forms that you need to go to. One form, you can decide um, what you're choosing to submit around. 
Uh, we offer training sessions, which focus on creating awareness around specific topics, um, increasing professional skills. We offer listening sessions, which are intended to provide a brief overview of federal policy updates or ongoing research efforts. Uh, the purpose of these sessions usually then turns to the facilitators where they gather feedback from attendees and allow participants to have a voice in shaping the policies, tools, or other outcomes they're presenting on. Uh, we also offer networking roundtables, which are about having informal conversations on distinct topics of importance in the field. These sessions are guided by conveners, but are largely driven by the interests and experience of the experiences of the attendees. Um, networking roundtables do not involve any presentations because they're really about uh, getting together in a group and discussing big topics and networking with one another. Then we have our concurrent sessions, which are the um, typical 90 minute sessions on Monday and Tuesday afternoons, um, which feature a variety of different ideas and topics, some around the theme like Lori mentioned, but there's also going to be many sessions around recent developments in the field and other topics that are inter of interest to our community that we'll find out once we read all the proposal submissions. Um, then on Wednesday, we have new research policy and practice sessions, which are designed to share information on recently completed or ongoing research programs, projects, and initiatives. And these sessions are designed for groups to present their work, to engage um, and exchange ideas, and to get feedback from audience members. Okay, so a little bit about our criteria for submission. Um, you're welcome to submit an idea to be an individual speaker on a natural hazard center organized session or to submit an idea for a full panel that you will help to collaborate with us to create. Um, please do only submit one idea per submission form. So if you have multiple ideas you wanna submit on, that is great, we'd love to have them all, but please do submit a new form entry for each um, new submission and new idea you have. Um, you will need to submit your contact information, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional expertise. And then we ask for you to submit your one big idea in 30 words or less. You will have an opportunity to expand on this, but getting submitters to really offer a concise statement of their idea really helps us to organize all of your submissions um, so we can start planning our sessions. And this year, we're also asking you to please submit a diversity statement to let us know how you believe that you and your ideas will contribute to a rich and diverse conversation during each session. Um, and at the Natural Hazard Center, we do understand there's many different types of diversity, which is why we're asking for you to explain what your diversity is in this context. Um, there's demographic or social diversity, of course, which are differences of social attributes such as gender, age, ability, ethnicity, and race. We also will, uh, will accept ideas on functional diversity, uh, which are differences associated with one's disciplinary or occupational skill sets or diversity in informational, cultural, and educational backgrounds. We just really try and get diversity across all academics, policymakers, and practitioners for each session and know that the best conversations happen when different perspectives are brought to the table. And so that's really our goal of that diversity statement. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our selection process. So we do accept submissions across a variety of topics, like I said, um, and um, some of these are ideas that would be of community interest, um, on new or unexplored areas, uh, submissions on recent disasters or other major, major advancements in the field. What we look for in submissions are clear ideas that cover multiple perspectives of an issue, ideas that include diverse perspectives, and ideas that would benefit our community to discuss and debate together. Really, like Lori said, we have we like everybody at the workshop to be a pr pr provocateur, so we want ideas that are going to really spark that discussion amongst all the participants. And how the review process works is that once our call closes, our internal review team will organize all of the submissions by topical area, and then we begin ranking them based on a, a selective criteria. Uh, you will notice that sometimes we have a full panel submission that gets to have their own session because they have a really novel idea that was really well defined. They included diverse speakers in their um, form. Um, for their sessions, and they had a major contribution to offer to our audience. And then other times we'll take individual submissions as well as sometimes panel, full panel ideas that were submitted and combine them with others who submitted because around a similar topical area. And this usually happens because um, sometimes a lot of people will submit around one idea um, or one topic area. And we believe that a session um, will merge them together if, a, if we think a session will be stronger because all of those participants working together will create a better session. So sometimes we do merge ideas if we have have too many around one topical area. Okay. 
Uh, so before I turn it over to Jolie, I would like to announce that our poster abstract and research highlight submission forms are now also available on our website. So if you're interested in poster um, submitting a poster abstract, um, they are due on March 15th, 2024. There will be two poster sessions at the workshop, one on Sunday evening and one on Monday evening. Uh, you will be invited to present in person on your assigned evening. You need to bring a printed out four by four poster and also submit a PDF version of that poster uh, for viewing online. We'll have those posted for everybody to view online, but we'll also have them rotating on screens at the actual workshop for people to see. Um, and then we also have the research and practice highlights submission form open, and those are due on, July, on June 7th, 2024. And these are not for presenting, just to make that very clear. There's not a presentation that comes with these, but rather these will be brief abstracts of new projects, programs, initiatives, policies, or publications that you might want to share with members of the hazards and disaster community. And we'll post these final abstracts on our website so people can go through and peruse those. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Jolie Breeden, um, who will discuss the roles of the workshop. Jolie is our lead science um, communicator and editor of the Natural Hazards Center. Take it away, Jolie. Hi, thanks, Jen. Um, so as Lori said, at the workshop, we recognize that everyone is an expert in something and everyone has a story to tell. And so because of that, we work really hard to make sure we get to hear all the voices in the room and that everyone is inspired to add their voice to the conversation. So if you choose to be part of a workshop session, you'll be a huge part of what facilitates that. So that's why I wanted to take a moment to discuss each of the several roles that could be played um, at the workshop. So one of the most crucial roles is that of a moderator of a session. Moderators are really the glue that hold the sessions together and they have three main jobs. Before the sessions, the moderators bring the panels together to facilitate discussion among the panel members. And in conversation with those panelists, what they do is help everyone determine how the panel will play out, how the interaction will flow, and what ideas will be included in that session. So they're really key in determining the scope and highlighting the expertise of the panelists and crafting the conversation. Because most of our workshop sessions aren't panels in the traditional sense, they're really conversations that happen among the panelists and with the audience. So during the sessions, the mod moderators will facilitate conversations that the panel decided on, and they can do that in a number of formats, such as posing questions to each panelist, or they can guide them and showcase in their expertise. But what is really important is, again, that they create space for that vibrant exchange of ideas to occur. Oh, and they also have to make sure everybody stays on time. Finally, um, after the panel portion of the session, the moderators will facilitate audience interaction. And that means making sure that as many audience members as possible get to speak and that the interaction is equitable and diverse and really represents the broad spectrum of people in our audience at the workshop. So on to panelists and presenters. Um, panelists and presenters also, of course, play a very important role. It's their expertise that are really the building blocks of the session. If you're a panelist, you're usually going to be given a short time to present your background and give initial thoughts on the topic. And then in most cases, um, you'll be guided by the moderator to share perspectives in the context of the other panel members and what they had to say. And then you'll expand that to audience interaction during the Q&A portion. Presenters also play a similar role, although the sessions that have presenters, those are the new research practice and policy sessions. Those have a more traditional presentation forward format. Audience interaction is still really key in those sessions though. So if you are a presenter, you'll still wanna make sure that your presentation really sparks that audience interaction. So last up, but not least, I wanna talk about conveners. Um, conveners run our roundtables and occasionally other types of sessions. 
And conveners are kind of like cocktail party hosts. They make sure that everyone knows everybody else. They keep the conversation flowing and they make sure that nobody gets left out of the conversation. They basically create a safe, safe and a comfortable space for people to discuss what they're passionate about. So we're pretty open to how they go about doing that as long as the focus is really audience centric. It could be as simple as sitting around in a circle, although we have had some conveners in the past who have done some really fun interactive activities as well. And we're happy to work on you with developing for, uh, format ideas if you do wanna be a convener for one of our round tables or another session that's similar. So um, those are the participants, participant roles in a nutshell. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Lori so she can tell you more about our two exciting add-on meetings that follow the workshop. So take it away, Lori. Nice, thank you so much, Jolie. And so as Jolie mentioned, in addition to the, the main event, the Natural Hazards Workshop, which is July 14th through 17th, 2024, we also partner with other organizations to host two additional add-on meetings. And so we partner with the International Research Committee on Disasters to convene and organize the annual research researchers meeting. And this has been going on for about 20 years. And it always follows right on the tail of the Hazards Workshop. So the Hazards Workshop closes at 12.45 p.m. We have a break for lunch. And then at 2 p.m. on Wednesday, July 17th, this research meeting kicks off. And it is, as its name suggests, the researchers meeting is much more of sort of a, for the researchers on the call who have been to formal academic conferences, the researchers meeting looks a lot more like that. And so the researchers meeting, uh, researchers submit abstracts, which are due by January 26, 2024. So you have plenty of time to get those abstracts in. And then researchers have about 10 to 12 minute blocks during the researchers meeting to share their uh, recently completed and or ongoing research. And the researchers meeting has really grown over the past several years as well and become even more uh, multidisciplinary, attracting social scientists, engineers, physical scientists, people from the humanities, and many other disciplines. And so we hope if you're a researcher, you will consider submitting an abstract to this meeting, which runs again half day on July 17th and the full day on July 18th. Our other add-on meeting that we have had just the gift of co-organizing with the National Hazard Mitigation Association, or NHMA, is the practitioners meeting, which is an all-day meeting that's held on Thursday, July 18th, 2024, this coming year. And the practitioners meeting, again, as its name suggests, it's really an opportunity following the workshop for practitioners to come together to talk about cutting-edge issues, new policies new emergency management and mitigation practices. And so again, part of the reason these add-on meetings were added to the workshop is they're, they're really opportunistic, right? 650 people are coming into Colorado for the main workshop for three and a half days that's bringing together researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and many others. And, but then this these follow-on events are about, again, giving sort of subgroups an opportunity to connect more with one another. Jen, back over to you. Thank you, Lori. Okay, so just before we um, before we switch to the Q&A portion of this session, um, I would like to go over a few logistics about the meeting um, and give you some more website links that you can click on. And just so you all know, this has been recorded. This will be available online. We'll post the slides as well. So you'll have all the links and all the information that we've shared today. Um, so first, registration has not opened yet, but we do have a registration webpage. Registration, we hope to open in early spring, probably early February is when that date will be. But we do have the costs already posted to our registration webpage. And one thing that in particular for this session is for anybody who's submitting an idea or a proposal um, to participate in the workshop, you please know that you are required to pay for your own travel and expenses and workshop registration. We do offer a $50 registration discount for anybody who um, gets chosen to be on a session, but because we are an academic nonprofit organization, we just cannot cover the registration costs for all people who speak at the workshop. Um, so thank you for acknowledging that once you're submitting your um, ideas. 
Uh, the travel information is available online as well as um, the hotel accommodations. We will have room blocks. They're not available yet, but we have links to the hotels that offer room blocks and we'll get those up as soon as we can also. But he, keep checking back to the travel web pages and the accommodation web pages because we'll post more information as we have it available. Um, again, don't forget, pro proposals are due on January 26th, 2024. We do not accept late submissions, so get all your ideas in now while you can. Um, also, feel free to email me or any of the other Natural Hazards Center team members at hazards.workshop um, at colorado.edu. We're happy to answer your questions as you're working through your submissions and everything. And then finally, there's a lot of other workshop opportunities that we post on the workshop opportunities place, um, page, so please take a moment to go check those out as well. Okay, and I'll turn it, oops, turn it back to Lori. Thank you, Jen. And so as we wrap this up and we're gonna stop sharing these slides that I saw Nancy already uh, submitted a question. And so Jolie, be ready to answer that one. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the people that you see on the screen right now. So this is a photograph of the Natural Hazard Center team. And today you heard uh, myself and Jen and Jolie speak on behalf of our team, but we just really want to, to acknowledge that every single thing that is made possible in terms of the organization and implementation of this workshop is made possible because of the roles that each of these people play. So you've seen Katie Murphy has been furiously posting web links in the chat. Jeffrey Gunderson is the one who makes sure that those web links go live and work. Jen Tobin leads the entire workshop planning effort for the Natural Hazard Center team. So when we all get an email from her, we know we have to respond immediately. And so I just really wanted to give a virtual round of applause to each one of these people for the role that they play in making the workshop possible. But one thing that we really want to say to all of you who are on this call today is that the workshop is what it is because of the people who attend it. They are what make this meeting so special. And it is the people who are here who make the entire meeting possible through your active listening, as you can see in that photo, and your participation. And so with that, Jennifer, would you stop sharing the slides, please? Because as anybody who knows me knows that I don't like looking at PowerPoint. I like looking at all of you. And so if you are here right now, this is the opportunity during the, we called it question and answer, but I think question and answer feels too sort of, you know, one directional, the questioner to the person who's going to answer. So we want that. If you have logistic questions, which again, Nancy, I'm going to call on you if you don't mind to ask your question out loud. Yay, you've got your camera on. So you're going to role model for us. So some people like Nancy right now might have logistical questions for Jolie or Jen or myself or another member of the Natural Hazard Center team, which I'm getting goosebumps seeing all of you um, right now on here. So some may have logistical questions, but some of you, like Patty, may be coming here with substantive ideas. I think I want to propose a session on X or Y or Z or A, B or C. Does this make sense? Is there anybody on here who's interested in that? We want that too. And so really we, um, as promised with the workshop, we reserve half the time for question, answer and discussion with this online meeting. We've now reserved half the time for question conversation and so forth. So really please either raise your hand or put your question in the chat and I will call on you. And if you can't come off and ask it, we'll read it from the chat, but we're gonna try to call on you because we wanna hear every voice in the room. So with that, Nancy, may I turn it over to you please to introduce yourself, name and affiliation, and then to pose your question. Okay, mahalo, Lori, thank you. Um, Nancy McPherson, I'm a planner with the State of Hawaii Department of Hawaiian Homelands, I attended the workshop last summer for the first time on the recommendation of Jim Buca, who's now uh, deeply in the Lahaina mm -hmm. wildfire recovery. Um, but I didn't realize that one could uh, possibly attend the practitioners meeting, you know, without some kind of special invitation. So I was just wondering, I, I didn't even know about the 
and HMA, and it sounds really interesting. Does one need to be a member though in order to attend the practitioner's meeting? Jill, thank you for that question and wonderful role modeling, Nancy. Jill Lee, could you please answer that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and the answer is a big yes. Um, you can go ahead and um, sign up for uh, the practitioner's meeting when you register for the workshop. It's a, 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 a small add-on fee, um, but you don't have to be a member of NHMA to attend. And in fact, it's a great place for people who are not working in the practice space to see what um, what they're doing in that space and what they um, what what kind of research might be useful to them, for instance, um, and uh, just to get to know people as well um, as uh, Patty was saying before we started our session. The time to exchange business cards is not during the middle of a disaster. It is at great events like that. So so short answer, yes. Thank you. And Nancy, great to see you. Kareen, you had a wonderful question. Can you please go ahead and pose that one? Yeah, I was just wondering if you can just go to only the researchers meeting or for that matter, even just the practitioners meeting or if you have to go to the whole workshop before you can go to those post workshop events. Nice. And Kareen, would you briefly introduce yourself to everybody on the call and tell us where you're calling from? Yeah, I'm actually in New Brunswick, Canada, um, and I'm an assistant professor of planning and community climate adaptation at Mount Allison University. And um, I've become increasingly interested in this area because of the impacts of hurricanes that have um, have that have been happening here in fires and flooding, actually. Thank you, Jen. Can you answer that wonderful question? Yes, thank you, Kareen. Um, the workshop and the researchers meeting and the practitioners meeting are three separate registration costs. And so while they ba they're back to back, they do run as three separate events. Um, and you can register for one of them or all of them, however you wish. Well, I guess you can't register for the practitioners meeting and the and the researchers meeting because they ha happen at the same time. <laughs> but you can register for the workshop and the researchers meeting or the workshop and the part practitioners meeting or one or the other. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And Lindsay, wonderful question there. Could you please uh, introduce yourself and pose your question? Yeah. I know Jolie answered it, but since this is being recorded, um, we would love to hear from you and yeah, hear your question. Absolutely. Um, well, hello everyone. I'm Lindsay Ginther and I last attended the Hazards Conference probably 15 years ago when I was Lindsay Barnes, my previous name, maiden name. And um, I... Um, work in renewables, so in the private sector. And um, so my question, first question was, you know, is the practitioners open to people outside of emergency management in the private sector like myself? Um, and appreciate getting the answer that it is. Um, if I can just I'll add a follow-up question. Um, a lot of my work obviously revolves around combating the climate crisis that we face and deploying renewable energy. Um, but I do a lot in terms of looking at different geographic, you know, variability and what impacts we might expect and how we communicate um, and analyze risk and therefore incorporate resilience into our designs. And so I'm curious, like, to what extent is the Natural Hazards Conference really starting to tackle climate change considerations, um, both in terms of mitigation, but how climate change will impact future events? Mm. Thank you, Lindsay, for it is, I remember you when you were Lindsay Barnes, so it is great to see you, and thank you for both questions. Jolie, would you like to tackle the first question? Again, you did a great job in the chat, but so everybody can hear. Sure, yeah, um, I would say absolutely yes. Um, uh, again, we really need to have all these voices in the room to be able to um, really think through and have thoughtful conversations about um, the problems that and um, and promises that we have available to us um, in fighting hazards and disasters. So yes, please in, um, tell your tell your private sector friends <laughs> as well um, because we definitely do want to have all those folks there, and it's so important for us, and um, especially this year when we're talking about communication. 
And I just want to say to Lindsay, we've, as a team at the Natural Hazard Center, we've talked a lot about language around this as the tent has become bigger and bigger and bigger for the Natural Hazards Workshop. We have had more and more community advocates and activists who have attended. We've had entire panelists of journalists. And so people from, again, people who are thinking about hazards and disasters from all these different dimensions, they are welcome under this tent. And so researchers, practitioners, and policymakers has sort of been our shorthand for a very long time, but we appreciate you raising that question as well as the question about sort of how does climate change fit into this? And so as noted, really our core at the Natural Hazard Center in terms of our various publications, research award programs, and the workshop are really related to natural hazards and when those natural hazards collide with human decision-making, vulnerable built environments, vulnerable social environments, and turn into disasters. And so natural hazards and disasters are sort of the core. Of course, we are living in a world where climate change is accelerating and disasters are one of the prime symptoms of a sick planet. And so with that in mind, we really recognize that there is sort of this inseparable line between hazards, disasters, climate change. We also recognize that there's much stovepiping, right? That there's sort of our, what we might call our traditional hazards and disaster community. There's this huge and growing climate change community. And sometimes we're using the same words, to talk about the same thing. Sometimes we're using different words to talk about the same thing. And sometimes we're not talking about the same thing, but we probably should be. And so we're definitely looking for those kind of deep integrations. And I think what you described, Lindsay, is a great um, representation of bringing that together. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And again, great to see you. you. Um, Brenna, you had a wonderful question. Would you come off mute and pose that one? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Brenna Sweetman. I'm a social scientist with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, and I, I'm happy to hear you say that this was a forum to kind of talk about big ideas as well as small ideas. Um, that said, I, I kind of thought it would be really interesting to try to pull together a panel, but this is very kind of preliminary thoughts. Um, hence why I was curious about the size, um, but really kind of will also share the initial idea was thinking about community engagement and, um, you know, what are the ways to engage people? How are you engaging people when you're working on getting science into the hands of people and ways they need it? Um, and just kind of having different perspectives on this. And, you know, much of what I work on is in the coastal flooding field. Um, but I think, you know, we're kind of engaging across the board on on um, natural hazards and figuring out ways to conduct more meaningful community engagement. So that, that was kind of my small question of how large is the panel and the bigger question of, you know, if anyone else is kind of interested in exploring this space, I would love to continue the conversation. Je Thank you, Brenna. Jen, would you like to tackle both of those questions? Yeah, so I think that um, I'm not sure if I got two questions out of that, but maybe I'll answer both of them in, in what I'm saying. But um, I love those ideas. And I think that that's, you know, when you have kind of like a, an idea seed that you want to expand and grow, <laughs> and the workshop is a great place for that. And it sounds like that's what you have. And sometimes the networking roundtables can be really great. Like it'd be a great, in my as you're talking, I was thinking this would be a great place to get all the people that are kind of interested in the same thing together to start talking about this and making those connections so that you can learn from one another. Maybe there's people that have more experience with community engagement and other people that have less or new ideas. And so submitting around a networking um, round table would be a great idea. And then what was what was the second question if there was a second one in there? Jen, it was sort of the, that was getting at it for sure that sort of the typical size of a panel. So if it was a concurrent session, we would typically have a moderator oh. and four speakers. But as Jen's saying, a, a networking roundtable is usually led by two to three people around a common topic like community engagement. And so, yeah, Brenda, is that starting to get it, these different sort of session types and sizes of, of in terms of how big is the panel versus the leadership? Yes, yeah. That is helpful to hear the explanation um, and the networking roundtable sounds like it might be a good option. So I appreciate that. 
Yeah, and, because if, even if you're the convener of a roundtable, you could be posing different questions and ideas that you want to learn more about, but also have it be where the, you know, everyone in the roundtable is discussing those topical areas. And so that would be great. Yeah. And, and, and then, bringing you know, with Jen, community engagement is such a hot topic right now. It, it will be on the program in some sort of way, right? But depending on, as Jen's saying, it might be a networking roundtable that may be woven into concurrent sessions, et cetera. Yeah, beautiful. And Cornelia, you said you'd like to tag on to that great question. Cornelia, did that start to get it what you were wondering? Or will you pose your question what you're still wondering about? Thank you. And introduce yourself too, please. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, I'm Cornelia. Um, I'm at the Disaster Research Center, University of Delaware, a PhD student there. And um, yes, uh, it already answered some of the questions. I think I was wondering a little bit more about the actual logistics of like, okay, how do you go about organizing a panel? So we are uh, I'm working with some other colleagues, um, uh, actually all people who met last year at the at the last um, workshop, um, grad students and uh, early career researchers. And we were thinking of, um, it's kind of like Brenna, uh, you know, like the seed of an idea, but something around um, hidden capacities, uh, organizations and uh, institutions that are not on the forefront when we think about um, response planning, response recovery. Um, so, what are some of the um, some of the ways that we can like that we can leverage all kinds of institutions that maybe are not like the first thing that come to mind? Um, and I'm wondering, like, if we are we are working on this. In a very practical way, are we um, are we providing uh, quote unquote um, all all the speakers and the moderator and the full concept, or are we starting something and then asking for people to to join us? Or and if we are too, we if we find too many people, how do we go about that? And um, yeah, Cornelia. You just in some ways took this very big hammer and hit a nail on the head for why we decided as a team, and it was one of our wonderful graduate students who suggested we have this Q&A session. So for those who are here, this is the first time we've ever held a, a virtual Q&A session like this for the workshop. And the question you just posed was in part, <laughs> one of the reasons we said, why don't we just talk about this publicly? Because people every year are sort of like, but wait, am I an individual speaker? Am I putting in a whole panel? Do I name names? Do I pick my favorites? Does it have to be people who've already confirmed, et cetera? So Jen Tobin, would you please take on this question? And thank you, Cornelia, for posing it. Yes, thank you. That is a great question. And the answer is kind of, it depends, but it's also just a spectrum, <laughs> right? Because you're sometimes we get submissions that are like, people do have exactly who they want to participate in that session. We do allow one moderator and four to five um, panelists per regular concurrent session. And so um, we do have an area on the forum where you would, you know, you put in your big idea, you put in the, the longer explanation, and then you can add um, uh, suggested panelists. So we have places for you to add panelists there. Um, so you might have everybody figured out. And in your longer description, you would say something like, this is the idea that we're having. Here's the diversity. You would have the diversity statement of the panelists that we're choosing to speak on this uh, topical idea. Here's what's going to be covered. And here's why it's a good session, basically, in, the, in that brief um, abstract. Um, but if you didn't have the panelists decided, if you had, okay, well, we have one person that would be great to speak on this topic. However, there's three other subtopics we want covered. Can you help us, like the Natural Hazard Center, can we help you find those people to fill in the rest of the panel? That is also perfectly acceptable because we're doing that anyway. As people get submissions, we might have three other people that really are speaking to the thing that you're trying to, to talk about in your abstract. And so we might say, okay, here's another person who had a great idea. They submitted as an individual. Can they jump on? your session and they would really round out that discussion. Um, so like I said, it's kind of a spectrum of ideas, but you can just say what you what you have, what your intention is for your panel and where you need help building out the rest of it and we can work together. So it's really a, a, um, a collaborative effort. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Did that answer everything for you? 
Uh, yes, I, I think it did. Okay. Can oh. I sneak in a follow up? Yes. <laughs> um, just in terms of because I see that the abstract is very short. Uh, at what point does everything need to be like really figured out? So um, we kept the abstract short for a reason. Like we, this isn't like a, a research paper abstract. We don't want to know the literature review supporting evidence of why why you're submitting this topical idea. So we really want to cut down on that and really just say like, what is this session going to be about and why is it important? Um, and so I think that if you would like to follow up on that idea, like we'll have more discussion with you after as we start de developing the different sessions, we can, you know, contact you again and we'll work together to create a, a session description and kind of really work with you to kind of build out the rest of your session if you're chosen for a panel. Um, but then also you did have another question about how, what if you have too many speakers? Uh, we do, we are pretty strict on the number of speakers first because it just doesn't allow for um, audience engagement if you get too many speakers on a panel because everybody needs to have their part. But we do allow one moderator and that four to five panelists per session. So we would ask that you wouldn't submit. I don't think you, we even allow you to submit more than that. So you would have to kind of narrow it down and think about who's going to be the best representative. However, one thing that I will say is that when we've um, experienced this in the past, what we've recommended is that still invite those people who wanted to speak on this topic, because if they're part of the audience, there's 30 minutes at the end of every session that is going to be about audience engagement. And they might be the first person to say, hey, I have something to contribute, or I have a question, or let's start this conversation. So maybe they're planted in the audience with additional parts of the conversation. So they're not left out in any way. Great, thank you. Thank You're welcome. You. So Mike Peoples, would you please pose your question and introduce yourself? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mike Peoples, American Red Cross. I'm the uh, reunification program manager for the organization. Uh, and honestly, my question is a relatively simple one around would people on the call be interested in a session uh, that kind of discusses reunification pre, post, uh, or pre, during, and post, uh, either from simply the, re the Red Cross perspective, or we work really closely with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, as well as FEMA. Uh, so I've got counterparts in those two organizations that we could pr potentially bring on as panelists. I just kind of getting a gauge for uh, what you all would think. Mm -hmm. Mike, I just wanted to say first, thank you for the work that you do and for posing this question. And this one thing, um, I know we've been talking a lot about if people sort of have full panel ideas, how do they handle that? But let's say that nobody raises their hand right now and says, yes, Mike, I, I want to do that do not be discouraged. This is where those individual sessions that Jen described come in because what you are doing is absolutely vital. This is obviously an, an urgent and pressing topic. And so if you said, oh, okay, I, I didn't walk out of this session with a full panel, maybe I don't know for sure who's attending the workshop, that's where you could send in one of those individual session ideas. And you bet, you bet you me when we read the session ideas and we go, oh, yep, reunification, that is a topic that we hadn't yet thought about. And so if we don't have enough to craft a full panel, maybe it becomes like we don't want to lose that idea. So it becomes threaded into a related session, et cetera. So there, that kind of gets at how we handle those individual session submissions, as Jen was saying. Sometimes you may not know it, but five other people may submit reunification and displacement ideas and you end up being on a panel <laughs> and everybody goes, how did they do that? Um, and other times, if there aren't enough to create a full panel, but the idea is still great, we might weave it in to something that's related enough and hope that those threads of connection get woven tightly during the session and discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. And thanks for being here. Um, Tamar, would you be willing to pose your question next, please? And introduce yourself. Yes, sorry, I'm not fully, I'm not fully <laughs> camera ready, but apparently I'm now fully camera ready. Um, I, uh, my name is Tamar White Lake. I'm with the Veterans Emergency Management Evaluation Center. And um, I was really excited about your topic this year. Um, 
uh, it's sort of to the point of your previous comment, which is maybe or maybe not, there are people who are interested in putting together a panel. Um, the specific theme that really interested me in the current workshop is what new partnerships are improving equitable but best practices around reaching new and creative audiences. And we're currently working on um, understanding how the VA can extend its emergency management resources to specifically contracted home health agencies and by extension home health aides because they were um, home health aides. If anyone has done any research on this, as were identified as really being highly isolated during the pandemic and um, are clearly an essential part of maintaining people in their homes and um, during emergencies. So if anyone is interested, I know that mine is very VA specific, but really just this idea of extending in creative ways into um, home health agencies or other community agencies through existing resources. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tamar, for that shout out. And um, we are very much looking forward to welcoming you back to Colorado again next summer. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Aaron Titus, neighbor down the road, would you please introduce yourself and pose your question? I sure will. And I am a little under the weather, so I will spare you all the video at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you alluded to this uh, question earlier. My mind is the, you know, what if you have uh, a, a few ideas, but one is the most important. Um, should you uh, indicate which is the most important, um, or just throw them all in and hope that hope that they pick the most important? Um, so that's that's the main question. Uh, then another uh, I, idea. I don't know if you're familiar with the unmarket. I'm sorry, not unmarket. Unconference uh, format, um, but it would seem to me that including an unconference. Uh, component might be a really good fit. So uh, in, in short, you it, it's a great opportunity when you have a whole bunch of experts uh, who want to talk about something and you have a grid with uh, uh, rooms down one side and timeframes on the other. And you say, here's my idea. You pitch it to the group in like 30 seconds or less. You put it on the grid and then everybody breaks and decides which one they go to. So it's a it's a very organic, but it's a really great way to kind of formalize uh, informal discussions among professionals. So, um, yeah. Oh, oh, and I'm the executive director of Crisis Cleanup um, and a leader in the VOAD movement. So thank you, Aaron, and thank you for joining us, even when under the weather. Jen, <laughs> would you like to take the first part of that regarding... Um, the, the 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 question about how do you what if you have multiple ideas do you need to prioritize them etc absolutely yes I, like i said um definitely submit your ideas on different forms but just so you know when you're putting the abstract information in um you are speaking directly to us we're going to read that so feel free to say like hey this is my top idea i would prefer this one get chosen over any other <laughs> you know just a little brief <laughs> mention to us is totally fine because carson mary Jolie and myself will be reading all of those and then arm wrestling at the end to see who wins, <laughs> whose favorite ideas get chosen. Um, and Jolie is definitely the strongest. <laughs> so put your money on her. <laughs> um, but not no joking, you can really just write directly to us if you want us to know something special in particular that's kind of outside what we're asking for in that area, feel free to write to us directly. And Aaron, th thank you for that. And um, Aaron, to your second question about the unconference idea, I think that is a absolutely wonderful idea. And that is in part why we started forming sort of the, the networking sessions and various listening sessions. We've tried, we've played with a lot of different session formats, um, training sessions, to try to sort of move away from the panel at the front of the room to try to encourage some of that interaction around core ideas. So love it and thank you very much for it. Um, Sharita, next up, please, would you introduce yourself and pose your question? Hi, my name is Sharita Bradshaw Jackson. I am an emergency manager in the transportation department. I mean, in the transportation sector. Um, which question do I pose? <laughs> so a lot of things that I've done that I realized when I came to transportation, because I worked for um, as in the NGO sector and I worked in the hospital sector, and I noticed trying to merge emergency management with um, the ideals that were already set in place for the transportation sector 
was very hard and I'm still working on getting them to understand that you guys are great at what you do. You guys um, move people at, at all times, no matter what the conditions, but we still need to prepare. We still need to uh, practice. We still need new policies and procedures. And most of their vision, um, the leadership vision is focused on creating an image of safety, of creating an image that we can do this no matter what. However, I've discovered that a lot of the employees are lacking a lot of the um, the knowledge as far as the training that is required, the uh, practice in it, because we just did a battery electric bus and it was a nightmare <laughs> because they were treating it like a regular bus. So my um, research or my workshop, whatever, would be on how do we get leadership to follow what we need to get done during emergency disasters, having it done in blue skies before we get to gray skies. Because at gray skies, it's too late to say, hey, no, you guys forgot this or you guys need to do things differently. How do That's what it'll basically be on. Because my question is, is that something that is feasible? Because we can't really change leadership mind. We can only show them the right way to do things or the appropriate way in the same sense, but that's my question. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, Jen, do you want to take that one? Thank you, Sharita. Well, I just think it's an absolutely great um, topic idea. So I would love for you to submit that um, either as an individual submission or for a panel, if you have other, other people that would like to speak on that. But yes, I think that is a very important part of the session. And we do have a lot of people from the Transportation Research Board. Is that what it's called, Lori, TRB? Mm -hmm. At the uh, National As you attend the workshop. So I think there would be so much interest in, in hearing your discussion on that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Sharita, to your, um, to sort of the overarching comment about combining research and practice and so forth. We recently funded some um, researchers who are studying transportation issues and disasters. So that's exactly as Jen's getting at it. If you submitted an individual session proposal as an emergency manager, we might be able to combine it with a researcher proposal, et cetera, and have that diverse uh, organizational representation on the panel. So again, thank you. Uh, Nancy, would you like to pose your question next, please? It's kind of a long one, but, um, and I did get some feedback from uh, June, so I am already getting tapped in, but, um, <clears throat> and I didn't post this to everybody, but one of the issues that's come up is a lot of misinformation, mistrust, and cultural clashes with the Native Hawaiian community around FEMA assistance and just mistrust of federal agencies in general. So I kind of wanted to connect with other tribal and indigenous uh, practitioners and researchers to find out if other indigenous communities are having this issue um, and try to get a, a panel or maybe just a round table uh, proposal together. But I didn't know how to connect with other tribal and indigenous folks working with tribal and indigenous communities. So I was just wondering, is there a secret network that <laughs> I don't know about yet? Well, Nancy, thank you for that. And that is definitely very um, on theme and in, in various dimensions. So as you know, we organized the tribal listening sessions and Melissa Villarreal, who is one of the graduate students at the Natural Hazard Center, actually she and Shelby Ross generated a large contact list. And so I have made note of your question and about sort of this is again about making connections and we will follow up directly on that question. So thank you. And Hana, I think we have time. One of our commitments is we start and end on time at the Natural Hazard Center. So I think we have time for your last set of questions. If you would introduce yourself and pose your questions, please. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hannah Friedrich. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Arizona. Um, I posed two questions. I think my second one was answered. It was very closely related to what Cornelia had posed. I won't say that, but I just wanted to pitch out the idea of um, an idea around a session on disaster insurance and specifically around property or homeowners insurance, given kind of in light of everything that's been happening with a bunch of carriers dropping out of areas and kind of what that means for the livability of places going forward. Hmm. Thanks. 
again, such a wonderful, um, important, pressing, urgent on the tip of people's tongues and top of people's minds right now. And I, I think it's a great idea. I'd love to see that Lindsay already responded to you and we would love to see a session proposal on that. Um, and with that, we just want to, uh, as always, starting and ending with gratitude. Thank you so much to all of you who showed up to our first ever Q&A session, I hope, and don't think it's going to be the last for the workshop. Thank you for your incredible questions. Thank you for your time and thoughtful care. Thanks to the Natural Hazard Center team, and especially to Jennifer, Jolie, and Katie for all the work to bring this together today, and Jeffrey. Thank you to each of you, and um, we cannot wait to receive your proposals for the Natural Hazards Workshop in January of 2024, as well as we hope for the researchers meeting and practitioners meetings that follow. And of course, you can reach out to us at hazards.workshop at colorado.edu with further um, questions or requests, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, everybody, so much for your time, and we are really hoping to see you in July in Colorado at the Omni Interlochen Hotel. Thanks, everybody. Have a beautiful day. Bye.